US military officials talk about the timeline getting shorter and, and things like that. It does feel that we are sort of moving more and more closer to the, to, the, to the prospect of war, doesn't it? Well, you have to remember what the job of the military is. The military, um, and I mean this complimentary, it's a hammer looking for a nail. Their job is to be ready to fight. Their job is to be ready to fight tonight. Um, so that is what they're preparing for, and that is what they should prepare for. And when you hear from them, that is the story that you're going to hear. But you also have other counteracting parts of government, such as the State Department, uh, such as the Commerce Department, such as the Treasury Department, other tools that can be used uh, in a situation like that. So balance out what you hear and where you're hearing it from. Uh, and again, I don't mean that to undermine the militaries whatsoever, but that is their job. Our next question from Melissa Code. Hello, Mr. Spencer. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. You referenced counteracting parts of uh, government, uh, which act in, in orchestra and in context of that hammer looking for the nail. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those being the president. <coughs> in 2019, if we can return it, in the context of your history um, theme. Albeit brief, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, you wrote uh, after your tenure ended that the command influence of Mr. Trump had negative implications for military justice and the rule of law, but it could be said that volatility and that style of leadership also has implications for geopolitics and a relationship black like AUKUS. Can you tell us whether uh, the right changes have been made to prevent something like that negatively impacting something like the AUKUS agreement in future, um, and whether the US has learned that lesson? That's a terrific question, and it's very observant. I would, I would say um, since January uh, of the great problem that we had in Washington, a lot has been learned, a lot has been observed. I will not be as naive as to say that the US is homogeneous in its thoughts. Uh, our little experiment of democracy allows for a lot of different points of view. I do believe, though, that uh, Congress does its job in counteracting uh, or being a counterweight to the executive branch. And I think the system does work well in that regard. If I can ask another question, um, can you walk us through at what point you decided that relationship with the president was intractable and you couldn't navigate continuing on in your role? For those of you who, uh, who might not know, uh, my altercation with my commander in chief was based on a suit, uh, uh, actually a lawsuit, a court martial, I beg your pardon, from uh, a special operator by the name of Chief Petty Officer uh, Eddie Gallagher. And uh, I'll compress it um, because the press got behind, uh, the conservative press got behind the fact that they thought the Navy was railroading Chief Gallagher. When I first arrived at um, the post, in 2017, we, there were many issues that were going on with the special operating forces. They've been deployed a tremendous amount of times. Um, command and control in certain situations was maybe gray. In the Navy, with the SEALs, we put into place through um, Admiral Tim's command a, a, a program to bring us back to ethical true north because we were having deviation from the norm. And what I mean by deviation from the norm is you let something go by because it's a small issue and you're four degrees off center and everything still works. And then another issue, which is a little more grievous, bends it seven degrees off north and you go, oh, we're still good. Well, sooner or later, you're 90 degrees off and the, and, and, and the arrow breaks. So we had started a whole new program with incoming new special operators. The SEALs that uh, turned in Eddie Gallagher were the graduates of that new program. So I was heartened because I believe the program works. Um, the president got very much involved in the case. Um, the Navy had a hard time trying the case, to be very frank with you. Uh, it was a Perry Mason moment in that uh, we provided amnesty to one of the special operators without asking him if he had killed the 
enemy combatant in question. And for those of you who covered the story, you know exactly what happened. At the 11th hour, they bring him up to the stand and he said, Chief Gallagher didn't kill the enemy combatant, I did. And double jeopardy, he can't be tried. That was a total whiff on our part on the Navy, to be very frank with you. My altercation with the President of the United States was in the administrative end. Uh, Chief Gallagher was acquitted of everything but being uh, having a photograph taken with the enemy combatant with a knife to his neck, if you remember, which right there I think is absolutely egregious for many reasons, not only for what it did for other Navy special operators and or anyone wearing a uniform, but what it did as far as our enemies looking at it, going, oh, they preach this, but they do that. So it was very meaningful that we handled this case appropriately. Now we're retiring Eddie Gallagher out the door. All I wanted to do was to get Chief Gallagher in front of his peers and have his peers review his record. If in fact his peers said he can keep his trident, he can remain a seal for the rest of his life, I was perfectly okay, they passed the decision. If in fact they came back and said he is no longer a seal, will remove his trident, the deal that I was trying to strike with the White House was I will give Chief Gallagher his metal, his uh, seal token back to keep the president at bay, to be very frank, because nothing good could come of this. We were trying to protect the institution and let the institution heal. The community, the special operators community, knew what happened. That was the most important thing. Me giving him his trident back was tin. Uh, the president turned around and said, no, you will not put him in front of a peer review board. And I said, yes, I will. And he said, you're fired. You said you wished that you'd consulted the Secretary of Defense um, rather than make some independent decisions as the interventions and things were bubbling along. Can you tell us a bit more about why that would have been? Yeah, yeah, Secretary Esper was traveling in Asia at that time, and I was briefing his chief of staff, which in most cases, that's briefing the principal. And whether Secretary Esper chose to say he was briefed or not, I have no idea but he feigned ignorance to my dealings in the White House, but yet his chief of staff knew exactly what we were doing. Um, thank you for, the, for that. I, I was a little familiar with the, the story, but thank you for illuminating us all on that.